This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the church. We're going to run that. Get on. Welcome to the best hour or so in the universe. It's Reasonable Doubt. Mark Garagos in studio. Not only in studio, but I think this may be. You can check the um, the tape. This may be the first time both of us are here in studio with collared shirts. Oh, yeah. I had to do a hit this morning. They drive the van wherever you're going to be. It's you the know. best, isn't it? When they, when they drive it in the driveway to the house, mm-hmm. and I can sit in the Lazy Boy, I can wait until the last minute, throw a collared shirt on, hop into the van. It, uh, you can't beat it. They figured out a way to bring the mountain to Mohammed, and you realize this whole COVID thing, whether it's all the Zoom meetings or whatever it is, it's great, but this isn't. This isn't digital. They physically just drive the van to where right. we are. And Come. it eliminates, you know, all of these people who've spent a fortune as we're sitting here in a studio to do that. At least here you've got, I mean, the amount of production you've got is incredible in terms of what you're producing. But they I remember 25 years ago when CNN was the um, kind of the monolith or behemoth and then Fox was just starting off and MSNBC was starting off. And when we would have a case and I would have to kind of run after court to go do the three shows and things, these these studios that they had built out were incredible. And now you just got like a sprinter van. Is that what they had? The- yeah. I actually brought you up in this uh, little diatribe I did this morning because it was on um, Brian Kilmeade's show. And uh, they were responding, and I'm curious what your thoughts. And Gary, you can look for this. Or Chris, Chris, I think, has it. Um, Which is uh, Russell Brand addressed his, you know, they put together this whole Joe Rogan hit list. Oh, I saw the hit list. Adam Carolla, parentheses three, on the right side of the ledger. Right. So it's how many appearances and who you are. But as as per usual, and I'm directly under Russell Brand, who uh, not what you typically think of as a right wing activist. I w- when I saw it, I said, I watch his YouTube things and mm-hmm. I've been a fan of his since that movie that I, I was incredulous over him. Also, by the way, Tulsi. Why is yeah, Tulsi? Yeah. She's a Democrat who disagrees with some of the things that the Democrats the, say. The orthodoxy. Right. So yeah. that gets you into the right wing camp. And then you look at guys like Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein. I mean, these are these are progressive people. Who, what about Barry Weiss? Just because Barry decided to to just not toe the line. I mean, and then, by the way, read some of the comments on when I do something with you. Mark's red pilling. Mark's doing a God forbid, why is it always one or the other? Why can't you just try to look at an issue? I I don't know, but if, and we'll we'll listen to a, a, uh, yes. a minute of Russell responding to this, and then we'll get into uh, okay. the court cases that we're planning on talking about. But this is Russell responding to, I guess, the alt-right list he and I made it onto. <laughs> We think and feel because we've all had unique experiences and we can't afford lazy labels like being right wing or left wing. That just used to be a thing. Now it's like a sort of an attempt to smear slander and take someone down. I know what this is. I've been in the media a long time. This is an attempt to say you can't trust Russell Brand. Russell Brand's unreliable. Russell Brand's a right wing figure. And to manage those figures. I mean, this is pretty much the same as when they produced that list of doctors, half of whom were vets. Now they're producing a list of right wing guests and one of them is me. Well, let me tell you some things I believe in. I believe that big tech companies should be really strongly regulated and broken down. I believe that massive companies should pay their taxes in the countries that they make money from. I believe that public health workers, firefighters, police officers, people that do jobs that put their own lives on the line should be properly paid, properly supported, properly trained. I believe that the most vulnerable people in society, the mentally ill, drug addicts, the vulnerable, should be looked after and taken care of. I believe that small businesses should be given every opportunity 
community to thrive. I believe that community should be run by the people that live in them. And however you identify, sexually, racially, religiously, that's your business. You're right. You should be whoever you want to be. That all of us should allow one another to be who we are and get on with it. And that we should have a media that tries its best to give us plain facts and allows us to sort it out among ourselves through plain, honest, open discourse. Not elevates and amplifies particular narratives to turn us against one another so that they continue to profit from their relationships with big pharma and big business while we're squabbling among one another. Here on this channel, we're not going to allow that to happen. We're going to continue to tell you the truth because we trust in your ability to judge for yourself what's real and what's true, which voices are out to support you and which voices are out to get you. You know, like, so when there was stories about me being an anti-vax person, like, as I always say on this channel, your life is your life. I believe in the same. All it's right. Amazing. So weird cut, but okay. <laughs> um, look, it's, okay. He, I, 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 to me, he is the embodiment of progressive, but he's got a couple of questions. Is that permitted? I, I, I don't, I don't get it. And then as I always say, as I was saying this morning, when I brought you up and Dr. Drew and me, uh, you're no longer allowed on CNN, so then you end up on Fox, and then that's the proof that uh, you're this right-wing lunatic. Right. And it's it's not a way to conduct uh, a news agency. It's not a way to con- it's not a way to conduct a society. Really, well, it's and you they weaponize and characterize and caricature people when you. When you listen to Russell Brand, if you actually spent, what was that, about a two-minute, uh, mm-hmm. two minutes, pretty much debunks the idea, right, in, yeah. in the two minutes. I will tell you, there is no more arch-evil human from the left than Steve Bannon, right? Mm-hmm. Steve Bannon is safe. So in the eyes of, of, the, of the left. Right. That's what right. I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Well, you said I've from actually, the left. I didn't yeah, from the left. Right. I appreciate that. Um, I have actually sat and had a conversation for a long period of time with Steve Bannon, a private conversation where we didn't talk about left or right. We talked about kind of global imperialism, who were the threats to America, things like that. You know, the caricature of Bannon, and I think it's funny. I laugh when Saturday Night Live does the thing. I think that's funny. I can laugh at that. But I can also sit with him and talk about Turkey, Iran, North Korea, China. And there is thought. There is stuff that goes into it. Is Bannon on the list? I he's don't think clear. he's – How is he not on the list? I don't think he's done the show. Oh, okay. I, I don't but, think we can but, I can look. There's um, a lot of names. And you can say, well, he didn't comply with um, the January 6th committee. I got it. Uh, Trump pardoned him. He was on the boat of the Chinese billionaire who was an expatriate. I got all, I got all of that. All I'm saying is you can still have a conversation with somebody um, without putting him into one camp or another. And I was trying to figure out – why I have this belief. And I think to some degree it has to do with um, fighting the government for almost four decades because I can have, I believe, a um, a knockdown drag out fight in the courtroom with a prosecutor who I disagree with vehemently and who's trying to basically cage my client. But at the end of the day, uh, if I can go outside and then have a civil conversation, isn't that what it's all about? Well, you you meet these people oftentimes if you're in our position. You first you meet them on TV. And the version you get from them on TV is basically the pro wrestling version right. of them on TV. And you hear about these guys, you know, a guy like Jordan Peterson or um Dinesh D'Souza or guys like that and you go oh look at these guys and look at what he's espousing and I, or Tucker Carlson and the, the list goes on and on and then you sit down and talk to them and they're very genuine they're nuanced they're interesting they're always smart they're educated and and by the way there's a reason we know their name it's not because they're race munging uh, right wing lunatic fringe nut jobs. It, it, those people, you know, there's a couple Alex Joneses out there, but by and large, I mean, if you really kind of go, there's Alex Jones, all right? 
All right, but name, give me the top five. And the answer is I don't really have any because th- those guys don't really get a lot of traction or airtime. You have to be, you know, you have to be nuanced. You have to have an angle. You have to make a point. And these people do. But plus the fact that when you look back on these guys' careers, you know, it's like you take Dinesh D'Souza. All right, you disagree with what he said. But you hear about his, like, oh, his family came here from India when he was 13. And then next thing you know, he was the youngest guy in Harvard. And then uh, next thing you know, he'd, 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 you know, Ben Shapiro or whatever, completed law school when he was 19 and a half and stuff like that. And you go, we're well, not dealing with a dunce. <laughs> we're well, dealing with people that lived in the world. And, and that usually have accomplished something that is amazing. And, you know, the... Part of their success, I guess, entails having people in the cheap seats take shots at them. Because, you know, a lot of that noise from the cheap seats, uh, and when I say cheap seats, I mean literally the somebody who will go online and be a, what do you call them, a hero? That's yeah. Your kind of, that, that's, it's easy to do when, when you're kind of anonymous. Uh, it's easy to do, but... What I've noticed is if you engage, then the caricature kind of slips away or melts away. Yeah, and also you can, you know, you can hate Dinesh D'Souza or Ben all you want, Ben Shapiro, but you don't want to invite them onto your show and really do battle with them because they're they're good talkers. They show up with a rucksack full of points and data and – you may not win that battle, and that's why they never show up. Then that's why you get this sort of blanket of, you know, misinformation. All right, well, why don't you drill down on what specifically this person got wrong and then address it? Uh, and when you do, you end up with ivermectin and horse pace, and then you look like an asshole. That's the times we're living in. All right. So, uh, Mark, uh, lots going on. In Boy, the news. there sure is. Uh, Gary, what's the what's the first topic of the day? I think it's got to be an update on the Palin trial, which I believe closing arguments were happening today. Yeah, I think they are as we speak. Now, this this is somewhat nuanced in this sense. Uh, at first, you wonder, at least I did, how did this case make it to a jury? Because on these cases, it's very difficult to get over all the... It's a high bar to prove malice. Right. And so this judge, once we started to look at it, this judge, Judge Rakoff in the Southern District, had held early on uh, and dismissed it. And then they appealed. They went to the circuit. Circuit reversed it. And trial's going on right now. Um, The way it's being reported, and I always say this because... Unfortunately, you don't have any kind of audio in the federal district court or video, let alone video. So you have to kind of pick and choose your reporters. And the way it was reported is first the New York Times editor, the former editor, got up there. And uh, it was being reported that he was somewhat abysmal uh, in terms of his testimony, that it was kind of like, oops, I didn't know. I mean, it was just – and he had expanded the bar of what – Basically, the excuse was for malice because you have to get jump over the malice bar to the point where basically you could print anything and just say oops afterwards. I mean, that mm-hmm. was kind of the commentary. And so it looked like they were doing well. And then Miss Palin, governor, the former governor, got on the stand. And by all accounts, it'll be interesting to see what the jury does. She did not do great. Um, Why not? Because they were asking her, cross-examining her, as you would, um, how did this affect you? Did you have – did you get uh, counseling? Did you uh, see a therapist? Did you do this? Did you – and she had answered things like that obviously make good sound bites. I don't know in context. But she had said, no, I I run and I do hot yoga. And so Mm -hmm. the people were mocking that. And then you have to take also with a grain of sand – I'm reading the article on Slate, then I'm uh, then another outlet, and it's an amazing kind of part of what we talk about, the left-right, like you've got to hate Sarah Palin, so we're going to be catty about that. Or if you've got a media bias, we've got to be catty about that. Yeah, so malice. Yeah. You know, just kind of get to the nuts and bolts. There was that shooting in Arizona, 
and New York Times sort of blamed it on Sarah Palin. And, and it was done in the context, I believe, of Steve Scalise's shooting in the baseball. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And so now she would go, you guys traumatized me by suggesting that I was in some way responsible for that massacre. And then they would go... Well, we're just reporting the facts as as we know them. Right, and we have a gun. We have a gun issue kind of agenda. They concede that. Well, what if could you get them to admit that they don't like her, like as an entity to a person? You know what I mean? Like we don't like your viewpoint. We weren't for you when you were running. We didn't think you were qualified. Well, that would be. And I wish I had a transcript in real time because. Um, By all accounts, David uh, Axelrod, who represents the Times, is an accomplished lawyer. I would love to see the actual cross. Right, because if I was talking shit about the New England Patriots, you could establish that I didn't like the New England Patriots long before I decided to print an article (laughs) saying that Bill Belichick was a rapist or something like that. And then you kind of go... Well, isn't that at least, aren't we at least setting the table for malice? Because you go, well, I just got a few things wrong about Bill Belichick and his lady friend. And then I would go, yeah, but you never liked them the exactly, whole time. Exactly, the whole time. And you would cite uh, previous. I think that's the way, and I would imagine that's what he did. But if you could dig up one article, <laughs> one glowing review of Sarah Palin from the New York Times, then you could go, no, no, remember three months earlier we were complimenting her. Right. Talking about that vivacious, right. charismatic right. Uh, executive from uh, and right I guess across from if, Russia. If, if I were Sarah Palin's attorney, I would probably bring 10 other articles where the new, that predated this article that were negative about Sarah Palin that might help make my malice case. The other thing that I thought was kind of a, um, it's obviously the theme. In opening, her lawyer talked about this is an uphill battle. I've been conceded that, which which I kind of thought, that's interesting. That's a kind of an interesting appeal to the jurors. That was an opening statement. Then I realized why. That was his theme, because when she testified, she said, I feel like I was David against the Goliath. Mm -hmm. So I think that the part of the thematic, and I'm sure that they're doing the closings now is, yeah, this is the the grand, the gray old lady, the grand dom of uh, the media. And she's Sarah Palin, who's been victimized. And she's trying to come back and she's waiving any loss of earnings. And and this is, you got to teach them, uh, you got to, you got to teach them they can't pick on somebody like this uh, without, uh, without any kind of repercussions. Speaking of teaching them, um, are you allowed to bring up precedent? when you're in front of the jury that way, when you go, look, this has to stop. We need a case as precedent to go, these big outlets can't smear individuals, whether they be famous or not, or Nicholas Sandman or whatever. Like we need a case that basically says to, for, for future generations to refer to that'll slow the roll of these people have been working with impunity. You know, it's funny because in the criminal context for years, um, one of the prosecutor's um, kind of mantras besides uh, prosecutorial 101, they'd always say, you know what circumstantial evidence is? When you walk in, your kid's got crumbs around him and the cookies are missing. You know, that's circumstantial evidence. They teach that. The other one for prosecutors was you need to send a message. This is you're the conscience of the community. As a jury, you got to say we're not going to tolerate this. You got to draw the line. And my father's line in response to that, um, I heard while I was waiting for bar results was you want to send a message, use Western Union. This is supposed to be judged on the facts. But that's constantly what it is. I remember Johnny Cochran used to. Johnny, before he was a criminal defense lawyer, was a civil rights lawyer at heart in L.A. And he used to talk. The O.J. closing was built on decades of him trying civil rights cases where he would say, 
you know who polices the police? You police the police. And you've got to send a message that you're not going to put up with this because this is our community. They work for us, not the other way around. So, yeah, to some degree, the 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 idea of trying a case is to empower the jury to want to help your client and – to, to some degree, talk about the odds you're against by whoever it is you're attacking. And, and help future clients. Correct. Correct. That's what, and hold on, that reminds me of something. Do you know what NordVPN is? Mm-hmm. Fastest VPN in the world. You don't even notice it's running. That's what's amazing. Switch your virtual location. It bypasses GEO restrictions. Access Netflix, other streaming platforms in up to 60 countries. Next generation encryption, strict no logs policy protects you from hackers and snoopers and other kind of interlopers. Public Wi-Fi. Is that dangerous, Gary? Public Wi-Fi? Absolutely. Okay. uh, It's a hotbed for hackers. NordVPN's end-to-end encryption what protects you on the go. NordVPN saves you money. Find discounts in other regions of the world by switching your virtual location. You can pay less for the subscriptions. Right, Gary? That's right. For a Cyber Month deal, go to nordvpn.com slash doubt or use code doubt to get up to 73% off your NordVPN plan and a bonus gift. The price drops down from $89 to $79 and you get one month free. So your total discount is 73%. Be quick because this offer is only for a limited time. It's equivalent to buying a cup of coffee every month, a small price to pay for premium cybersecurity and access to vast amounts of entertaining content. There's a 30-day money back guarantee if NordVPN is not for you, so there's no risk. Now, I know the crystal brain was headed somewhere, and you were saying sending messages. Where were, where were you going with that? Well, I was really just interested in, like, technically, can you bring up this being precedent? Yes, you can say this is how, absolutely. There's you can some say of the, the you, word you precedent? You can say you've got to set... You got to set a boundary. You can say precedent. You can't go to golden rule. Golden rule. The uh, in fact, this is in the civil context. You can't say. You can't articulate what would it take for you to be willing to have this kind of injury or something like that. But you can clearly say we need to set a boundary. You need to define what reasonable is. And that's up to you, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Is this reasonable? And then prosecutors will always default to use your common sense. Well, as you and I know – Common sense is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, there was well, something. Yeah. yeah. And in the, the Times is kind of screwed anyway, slices, because in a, in a weird way, if you are, whether it's in many of these cases, this Nicholas Sandman case, and, and there's a, quite a few others floating around out there that Kyle Rittenhouse is going to go down this road. The <clears throat> You have what I always like to play my favorite game, Stupid or Liar. Right. So whatever the outcome, whoever the entity is, could be the Times or CNN or Fox or whatever, either you knowingly did this, in which case you're a liar, or you just keep fucking up and <laughs> screwing up everyone's story. You never tell the story correctly. I always go liar. I because, You default to liar. Well, you know, when you when you look at like Kyle Rittenhouse, the information is so available. Like, you know, he didn't know anyone who lived in Wisconsin. Or, I feel he, didn't, I, he carried it because mom I, drove him. It's like I, his mom worked a double shift at the hospital and was sleeping. <laughs> like the gun was at the thing. His dad lives there. Like these are so it knowable. Became, it became. You have to get Pelicano, <laughs> Anthony, is it right? Pelicano. Pelicano. Yeah, you don't. You don't need to hire him to dig up this kind of but stuff. But it becomes kind of a, um, you know, the, the old expression, urban myth. It just becomes kind of an accepted fact. I mean, you. Can't- I, I, I do. I do wonder how much of news really does. You know, there's. These things become, you know, there's cases, you know, Brianna Taylor, she was in bed asleep and the cop shot her while she was sleeping. Well, she was up and they shot her while she was up. It's equally as bad, but she wasn't sleeping. Now, do you just hear this like a wives tale from another outlet and just run with it? Or does anyone just sort of stop and go? Maybe Rittenhouse knows somebody in Oshkosh. Why don't well, we I have find a, out? I have an example of of this. Gary and I did it yesterday. Gary, I'm, he hates when I do this, but do you have that um, Maggie whatever clip? I will okay. in about 30 seconds. Okay, so I'll set this up. 
there's been kind of the story du jour is been that it starts off with the archives, U.S. archives, has to go down and retrieve 15 boxes from Mar-a-Lago. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, I see that. And it includes a, a letter from Obama to Trump. Well, by the way, you know, there is a world in which maybe Trump wants the letter because I remember in real time it was reported that he – and I heard Trump say it – that he thought it was a very gracious letter, right? Mm-hmm. But apparently that was in his um, 15 boxes at Mar-a-Lago and they then – then it's all of a sudden reported it was classified information, that they're investigating whether it's classified information. Then I see a report that they have referred – the archives calls up DOJ and says, wait a second, we found some stuff. And they said, eh, go – basically DOJ says, go to your inspector general, you know, the kind of your school marm who, mm-hmm. um, who uh, polices you. So then there's a book coming out and the book is by Maggie – what's her last name? Haberman? Yeah, Haberman? I is believe it, it is I want to make sure yes. I got it. And – She's got – this is her bombshell disclosure. You know how when you have a book, one of the first things your your PR uh, – as your publisher does is they put out some juicy tidbit, right? You got to put out something to drive interest in the book, right? My, my publisher, you know, when they read the book, they then give it to a lawyer uh-huh. because they're like, look, if <laughs> – if Janine Garofalo didn't blow you backstage at the comedy <laughs> store, you got to say something now. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of that. You know, you, you want to know what the attorney said to me? What did he say? Are your parents litigious? <laughs> I said, no. Okay, good. Because you talked a lot of shit. <laughs> Are you? Can you imagine how horrible a son do you have to be? We're really, really the only vetting from the attorney at Random House. Was Is, did Janine lit- Garofalo oh, blow oh, you? Oh. And are your parents litigious? Those yeah, are the two questions. Those are the two. Yeah. Okay. So this then, I somebody tweeted this at me, and I played it yesterday, and I said I've just got to get and see. So they and, need the big drop from right. the book. Out and of you haven't of the book. seen Beyond from yesterday, right? No. Okay. Good. Because I want to get your unvarnished opinion of this before. This is all clear Doug Fur okay. that has never <laughs> seen a drop of tongue oil, varathane, or varnish. And Maggie Hamerman is with us now. She is also the author of Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump, and The Breaking of America. Maggie, we start with the toilet. Tell us what you learned. We start with the toilet. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, So as I was reporting out this book, um, I learned that staff in the White House residence would periodically find the the toilet clogged. The engineer would have to come and and fix it. And what the engineer would find would be wads of, you know, clumped up print, wet printed paper, um, you know, meaning it was not toilet paper. This was this was either notes or some other piece of paper that, you know, he they believe that he had thrown down the toilet. What it could be, Brianna could be anybody's guess. It could be post-its. It could be notes he wrote to himself. It could be other things we don't know. But it certainly does add, as you said, another dimension to what we know about how he handled material in the White House. We have known for several years since (laughs) my colleague Annie Carney broke the story that Trump was ripping up pieces of paper and that his staff was having to tape it back together for archival purposes. Uh, This is how he has handled documents and pieces of paper all his life in terms of ripping them up. But this was something this was something different and it was not, uh, as I was told, an isolated incident. Several times. <laughs> yeah, the John John Several times Max. This was something that they would they would periodically find this to be the case. Uh, you know, the, the the exact number, John, I'm not certain of, mm-hmm. but uh, it was not just once. And his toilet, like no mistaking <laughs> whose toilet it was. It was in the pipes. I mean, it was in the pipes, and uh, and th- this was this was this was this was his bathroom. So yes. Uh, and I'm asking about these specifics again because we've heard again from Andy Carney's reporting, you know, for years now. He, he would tear things up. I mean, you tear things up, you know, you throw them Correct. around, you throw them on the floor. That's one thing. You walk them into a toilet and you flush them down. That seems to be another. 
it's definitely different. And again, John, I can't get in his head. I can't speak to what the motive was. I can't speak to why he did it. It's, I think, important to note, Jeffrey Tubin has talked a lot about this uh, over the course of the last day, that the motive on why, you know, somebody does this uh, in terms of records and uh, poor record keeping in the White House, that would become, you know, a focus if there is some kind of an investigation into how he handled material. As you say, it's been known for a very long time that he was not exactly, you know, necessarily tucking everything away. And certainly, you know, there have been issues with previous White Houses about about records keeping. Uh, but this was the, the first time I had heard something like this. Let's put it that way. He has the ability to <laughs> declassify information. So yes. clearly yes. this yes. is yes. trying to hide information. And I think well, if he, the he, reason that someone would do I don't, say, I don't know where to stop in terms of the idiocy. I, but I don't want to lead this. I have no leading questions. I want your reaction. Well, first off, we they should have told uh, Jeffrey Tubin to pull his pants up and come in and join the conversation. <laughs> Number one. Number two. I just uh, here's uh, here's my sort of gestalt or, uh, you know, 30,000 foot view of the whole thing vis-a-vis Trump and, and certain others. But no, nobody more than Trump. If you are going to feed your audience a steady diet of this guy went to Arlington Memorial, he called every fallen soldier a loser, and then he urinated (laughs) on the tomb of the unknown soldier. So says sources that we can't name that have verified. And then other ones of him saying he told everyone to inject bleach into their veins and stuff like that. If you come, if enough of that comes down the pike, it then at some point you become a crazy gypsy lady who's sitting in front of a country store who's telling you about a UFO and you just kind of keep walking. Maybe there is a UFO. That that this is the problem. But we've heard so many stories. Well, all I could think of as she's saying this is somebody's watching this. Maybe th- four people, and the 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 leaps of logic. And the lack of pushback is is unfathomable to me. First of all, oh, was it his toilet? Well, it was in the pipes. What? It was in the pipes? Did you have a plumber out there? Did the plumber – was it Roto-Rooter? And he said, I found some paper. Also, I mean, the, the, the thing about a, the toilets is you know, there's a four-inch probably – cast iron main line that they're using over there and it it'll share the same main line exactly. with two sinks and 14 other toilets in the vicinity right but what did you do did you track the clumps of paper to do you do a, a reverse engineering of the pipes to see that it came from this toilet? i mean there's just a jump every single thing they jumped that they made okay they he tears up paper therefore he must be flushing it down the toilet what, how, were you in the bathroom with him? How do you how, how do you just make these leaps? How do you say – and then I saw somebody yesterday. This was blowing my mind. He liked to eat the paper. So then it was like, is this his fiber? He would tear it up. He would eat it. And then he would dump it in the toilet. I well, mean, I, I mean, again, at a certain point when they're like – he eats two scoops of Rocky Road and only offers his guests one. It's like, ah, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. you got to come up with some stories. But I don't understand the lack. These are journalists, right? They were. They right, These are journalists. When somebody says that, when you've got – they're interviewing another so-called journalist. Right. Who also works for the uh, New York Times. And apparently the qualifications were that she covered Trump when she was at the Post, okay? So I covered Trump when I was in New York at the Post, so now I'm an expert on his dietary habits. Well, look, I, I will say this, and, and, and it, everyone who fancies themselves a journalist of, of some sort, and I think of what we're doing as a form of journalism— you have to have certain lines, and and I'll give you uh, an example from the other side of the aisle. When I was, <clears throat> I've told the story a few times, but I don't think I've told it to Mark, or maybe it's been a while. But I, I was sitting in on Salem Radio, and I was guest hosting uh, Dennis Prager's radio show, and uh, they're right wing talk, conservative talk right. radio, and uh, Dennis is right talk, but a uh, a dear man and uh, and and a, and a thoughtful man. Um, and I'm sitting in there. And, Is he also a La Cunada resident? Yes. Okay. 
he is. He we have really a hotbed of intellectual curiosity, <laughs> no La Cunata, right? <laughs> so he, um, he this all when the whole um, Kathy Griffin uh, catch up picture uh, Trump had, head, Trump right. head, whatever mannequin head, yeah, it's, it's all going down. And, uh, and then during the commercial break, it's all kind of happening in real time. How long ago were we talking? God, it had to be four years now. Four, really? Four or five. I mean, Trump's in office. Right. It's got to be pretty early on. So, Gary, I'll look it up. May 2017 by my cursor research here. So I said four or five. It's coming on to five, right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm in there, and we go to commercial break. And then... The folks get around me and they go, we hear Baron Trump saw that picture and he thought his dad was dead. Now he's traumatized. So go back on the air when we come back from commercial break. That's, that'll be, we'll keep piling on to Kathy for doing this because his young son saw this and, you know, he's nine foot tall now, but back then he was just a little pike. And they, and they said, you know, Baron Trump, we hear Baron Trump saw this. And he was traumatized because he thought you know, Al-Qaeda had gotten hold of his dad. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and they said, no, that's, that's, the, that's the news. You know, feel free to talk about it. And I said, eh, I, I, it, it doesn't it, – first off, I, I, I said, I don't think so. I don't think that happened, number one. Number two, if it did happen – I don't think he really, th he may have seen the picture. He didn't think his dad, who was in the next room or something, or on Air Force One, was whatever. But I don't want to go down that road. I like to kind of keep my integrity. And <laughs> they said uh, Baron was 11 at the time. And I said, uh, Where, where'd you find it? And they're like, oh, we, find, we found it on you know, some right-wing, you know, conservative online publication or whatever. Right. And I said, uh all right, look, if you can find this story in three different other news outlets, uh, I'll talk about it. But it's just one right-leaning whatever. And and then we came back to the next break, and they said, we, we found it in, like, a few other news outlets. But it but it was all – they just picked it up from the one. Exactly. And I, I said, that's say. not three. That's still the one that these people are now printing. I don't think this happened. And I don't want to go out there and sound like an asshole. And I don't want 10 minutes from now people going, oh, you hear what Corolla said? That never <laughs> happened. He was in the, he was, he, he, he drove to school that morning. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? I, so I said, no, I said, I, I just, it feels weird. I don't really want to, uh, and it also feels like a lot of speculation, a lot of speculation. Well, and I don't want to be in that world. You and that, they could some... do that. They could do that with Maggie Hager, Hagerman as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they. I don't understand why. I, John Berman is a very smart man, and for him to sit there and not push back in the least. Well, this is this is a, a, a little inflection point, right and left, which is this sort of tacit agreement, which is like we're going to invite you on, but you know what to say, right? And then we're not going to follow up. Now, you kind of go, nah, fine. Trump uh, took a racing form and threw it in the shitter. Fine. That doesn't. But now let's take that same model and bring it to COVID. So there's no reason scientifically that school age kids should wear masks. Maybe there's no reason scientifically, you know, kids under 15 should get vaxxed. But we got a little script here. And we understand who's on, who, what page everyone's on. And then you come on. And I'll play the part of a news anchor or a reporter. <laughs> you play the part of a virologist. Right. And then you go ahead and talk up. You, you go ahead and say ivermectin is horse paste. And all, right. and all these other therapeutics don't work and masks are necessary. And then I'll nod my head. And every once in a blue moon... If we do get some real data and some real studies out of the Netherlands and I have to kind of do my job for 10 minutes, I will then couch it in a certain way. Like if it says, you know, masks aren't effective, so says a million uh, students in the Netherlands, I'll go, some people might say that masks aren't quite as effective as we may have presumed. And I'll just kind of soft pedal you this thing and then you'll say... 
Well, maybe not as much as we anticipated, but still, it would be a good idea, and then we're back on our script. Right. And this is the problem. It, it really doesn't matter with Trump and his toilet, but look no further than COVID, and look no further than locking down and shutting businesses and masking kids who don't need to be masked. It would be great if somebody was on that TV show pushing back, arguing, challenging. You don't have to yell. Right. I mean, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be WWE. Um, you could just ask some questions, right? Yeah. Couldn't you just say, well, do you, uh, when you say it was his toilet, you, you don't know that it was his toilet. You're, that, you're just supposing that. It, it, was it a plumber who told you this? I mean, did you say, are you trying to link this to the story about Mar-a-Lago to sell books? I mm. mean, why, why, can't, why can't there just be – you could never – I guess the reason that we talk about this on a show that is purportedly about legal cases is because something like that in journalism, I, maybe I understand, but you couldn't get – 90 seconds in front of a judge, any judge uh, who's, who's who's still hitting on all cylinders, and get that to be admissible. It would be the s- dumbest thing that's ever that's ever been proffered to a judge. What is the relevance of the toilet clog to the classified documents in Mar- Mar-a-Lago? Why are you trying to – tell me what the relevance is and what the logical connection is between the two. Also, it is kind of the job of a book editor to kind of go, really? Yeah. This is our, this is this as is opposed the, to are your parents litigious? <laughs> but you did you did stumble on inadvertently to uh, Gerard Butler's next great action vehicle, which would be Snake Clogman, White House plumber. <laughs> now here's what happens: the Trump type guys torn up greeting cards and thrown them. You know he's got he's got his kids. He never talks to. Him. He gets his stupid greeting cards for Christmas. He throws them into the toilet, clogs up. He goes in there with the snake and he's snaking it out. All of a sudden, yeah. Al Qaeda attack on the White House, and it's just him and the president alone in the the main head. You know he shuts the door. We find out he's ex Green Beret, of course, who got busted down after punching a uh, commanding officer. Now he's been relegated to the White, the House, White House plumber. plumber. The snake is a weapon. He uses it like Harrison Ford used the bull whip. So it comes out. The guy's got the machine gun. Whoops, you know, snaps it out of their hand. Grabs up. Uh, he grabs like the uh, gra- the drain clog stuff and sprays it at him. You know, shakes it. Psh, you know, ah, my eyes. Oh, eyes. Yes. And, I mean, I'm just spitballing. But I think you've owned this up. At a certain point, he's got to find a plunger. And there's just a moment of like, oh. Now it's on. Now it's on. Yeah. Slides it into his belt loop. Uh huh. Grabs the snake and the uh, Drano. Heads out looking for these guys. Take my money. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's that's a film. All right. Let's do one more. What do we got, uh, Gary? I know you had some stuff you wanted to talk about. Mark. Mark told me he wanted to talk a little bit about the truckers. Oh, the truckers. Yeah. yeah. I find this interesting. Tell me what you think. So the. You know, the, there's two different stories that intrigue me about each side of the aisle. Mm-hmm. So the right likes to talk about migrant caravans. Remember mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. Hasn't been a whole lot of that recently, has there, Gary? I haven't seen much, no. No, no migrant caravans. You know, that was where you'd always ratchet up the migrant caravans. That, mm-hmm. right. Is there, do you think, some... Flip side to that now with the trucking protest. The trucking protest, it's going to spill over into America at any moment. They're planning and blah, blah, blah. I just, what is it with these two stories? Canada is now with the trucking protest has become the equivalent ideologically as the migrant caravans. I wanted to get your take on this. Well, the migrant caravan was a sort of, I mean, it was happening, but it was used just as a scare, as the, scare tactic. Just as the trucking protest. Right. right. It was like, that's a scary scenario, and this is non-Americans, but our neighbors to the north standing up for liberty. And there's a couple things. One is the bridge from wherever in Canada to Michigan. I think it takes about $300 million worth of commerce a day over that bridge. So that bridge shut down. That's a big supply chain issue for a lot of Detroit-based or Michigan-based automotive companies as well. 
Uh, then there was some talk about Gretchen Whitmore showing up with some heavy equipment. To move the trucks. To move move the trucks. Or giving it over so that they could use it. Yeah, which is starts to bleed into interfering with the operations of a foreign entity. I wonder if we could mesh the two, if we could separate families, trucker families, and put them in Canadian cages. Then we could kind of yeah, have, we could we'll bring it all home. Right. But, and I know that a lot of the folks on the right are upset that the cops are wrestling with the what they call in Canada a jerry can, which is a gas can. Right. Did you see what the protest was after that? I didn't. I know Everybody there was... Everybody walking down... The, this is... They were trying to steal their firewood. There was uh, a lot of... Or not steal, and but they confiscate. Were gonna, and they were going to impose giving material assistance if people brought cans of gas. So you know what they do? Maybe Gary can find it. All the protesters started walking down the street carrying the gas cans. Well... Trudeau, for his part, does this thing that everyone does, which is basically look no further than tin horn flats. Here's this thing. I'm going to impose this thing on you and I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to subvert your freedoms in some way and impose this thing on you. Then you rebel and you stay open for outdoor dining or you as a trucker say, I'm not I'm not taking the jab. And then as the person that imposed this stuff, they go, this could all go away if you would just listen to me. And it's like, hey, Trudeau, this could all go away if you got rid of your mandatory vaccination for truckers. That's how it would go away. Well, but what en- ends up happening is in the big kind of political upheaval in the last three days has been blue. St- Here we go. Mm-hmm. Doesn't this crack you up? You got yeah. to admit, whichever side of the aisle you're on, that's clever. Yeah. Right? The It's also, I, I, I mean, you and I kind of talk about the political fallout, whether it's California or whether it's Canada or many of the blue states. Look, the, there's some overreach going on here and the, the inmates are starting to rebel and it's because of the overreach. It's not. And look, I'll, I'll we said I know four it. episodes ago, five episodes ago, um, you or I, one of us said, cause I got tweeted at it. This is not a winning issue, you know, which is kind of, and then I, there was a little pushback on that. And I said, no, this is, and I push back against the pushback. The uh, the Democrats have completely misjudged this, totally misjudged this at this point and should give in. We've said that months ago. And guess what? Now all of a sudden they're asking – Lester Holt is asking the president, what are you going to do about these blue state governors who have basically said forget it because they understand this is ridiculous? And he didn't have a good answer for it. Well, look, if if there's a – tornado and uh, the the governor declares emergency powers and says all citizens must go down to the root cellar for two days until the storm is blown over, then people will dutifully do that. And the, 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 the governor will be a 96 percent approval rating. But somewhere around day five, when the <laughs> skies look clear, People are going to start going, uh, is it okay to come out of the root cellar now? And the governor goes, no, no, still got to stay down there. And then somebody wanders out of the root cellar and he's arrested. And then that makes the evening news. And now we're on day 17 in the cellar. And, and, and by the way, the county right next to ours where the hurricane path traveled as well, those guys have been out of their fucking cellar for 11 <laughs> days. Those guys are playing ultimate frisbee at the park. Why are we still in our cellar? Because I have emergency powers. Well, how long before the guy's 92% approval rating goes down? It's well, not so much about a lot of the edicts. I, think- I have a question. If, these, if we're lifting statewide, it's a legal question. Statewide, we're lifting the mask mandate on February 15th? 15th. 15th. Tuesday. Why aren't we lifting the emergency mandate? Uh, I, I Would you explain that to me? I don't understand. We're lifting the mask mandate. However, we're going to leave the emergency powers with the governor? Yeah, right. Would you explain? Can somebody 
tweet at me how it's possible that we've now lifted the mask mandate. We've now left it to the counties to do what they're going to do. And by the way, on what basis does the L.A. County unelected Barbara Farrar, on what basis? Oh, the emergency powers, which are still in effect. So I get it. He's declared emergency powers, which then makes you not have the ability to challenge the constitutionality of any of this, of an unelected bureaucrat. But he's going to lift the mask mandate so that the theater is in the political damage because, by the way, Gary, what happens on February 16th? Last day to register to run for governor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, but – I guess I'm just where. Where's my tin foil? Uh, I mean, and and by the way, when is the Super Bowl? Thirteenth. Yeah. Okay. You can find a clip I liked or uh, Barbara Ferrer talking about doing this thing. I, they, when me when is some? You know, the I'm waiting for the brave judicial officer who's going to finally say. Uh, no, this is this is not this is not happening. Well, in also, look, uh, emergency orders are for when there's a flood, but when the waters recede, at some point you got to give it back because it's been two years, and uh, then under your logic, then it's just in perpetuity. By the so- way, Monday, I'll give you one more little example of what's been happening. Monday, the L.A. Superior Court is resuming trials. Mm-hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. We're resuming trials. You mean we've we're still in a state of emergency. We have basically had a, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, and we're going to resume trials, but we're still under a state of emergency. Can somebody reconcile any of this? No, I mean it's nothing other than what it is, which is you get all the power when we're under a state of emergency. If you can find that clip, Gary, I'll I'm just pulling it up on the search computer now. I have it. Give me about I'll buy 30 you, seconds. I'll buy you thirty with a Geico read. Do you own? Do you rent your home? Well, you do one or the other. That can be hard work. So you need something that's easy. How about bundling those policies with Geico? Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. Go to Geico.com. Get a quote and see just how much you could save and how easy it is to save when you go to geico.com today. That is geico.com today. And we'll uh, show you this last clip, Mark. It's short, but it is. You know, is uh, it, what, does it, is it emblematic of all that is fr- completely well, frustrating uh, about I, this? I, I will say this to all people who are setting policy. And I felt the same way about Rochelle Walensky when she was like, as a mother, I'm scared. Bitch, zip it. I don't give a fuck if you have kids or not. We want to talk about policy. Oh, here she is. She does this thing, which is what they always do, which is, but she cares. You know, a lot of us don't care about death. Here she is. Uh, we, I think we care deeply here in L.A. County uh, about a morbidity and mortality. I don't think we're we're ready to just sort of say, you know, people just die and that's just how it is. Uh, I think we're going to do our very best okay. to wow. continue to work. Nobody says just die. die. That's a, that's not the argument to opening up society of, of a bunch of scholars going, yeah, well, they just die. That's how it is because I want to go get my froyo. And I don't well, want to wear a mask. I, I assume this but is that's part their, of this. But that's how they argue. And right. That, it's because horrible. You this can't, virtue. And then they set up there's metrics and data points and hurdles that are idiotic, that yeah. make no sense internally, externally, or logically. And you're supposed to think that this woman should be making policy decisions. Where is the board of supervisors? I, 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 it's, it's, it's bizarre, upside-down world, and it's all our fault for complying. That's the I, last I, thing I, I will I'm with you a thousand say. percent. All right. Uh, you can go to AdamCarolla.com and find out where the, all the live shows are. Coming up in Spokane, Washington, the early shows are sold out, but some tickets to the late show, I think. And then uh, also coming up in Tacoma, three of the shows are sold out, but still maybe for a late night show Friday, a couple tickets left. 
Just go to amcrawl.com for all that. What do you got, Mark? Uh, GG's down in Palm Springs. Quite a weekend. You should be down there for the Super Bowl Saturday night at the V Hotel and Sunday out at the pool with Elixir. Come downtown LA, Engine Company 28th. It's going to be hopping for the Super Bowl. And uh, if you're in New York City, uh, GCT, the Prova, or uh, Love Pizza in Moxie Times Square. So, till next time, man, we'll curl from Mark Garriga saying, Mahala. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all new episode.